Hi, I'm Alex and this is Pucks and Paperbacks. In this video, I'm going to be reading the winners of the Goodreads Choice Awards in the Young Adult Fiction category from over the last 10 years. This is a collab with about 16 other booktubers. The playlist link will be down below. Go and show them some love because we have been working really hard on this video series. Let's go over the choices of the last nine years and I'll share my TBR as we go. The rules of this reading experiment are to read the winners of the last 10 years in your category. However, if you aren't enjoying that book or it is harmful in some way and you don't feel comfortable reading it, you can read the runners up and you don't have to reread a book that you've already read. So luckily for me, I'm your contemporary king and so I have read the majority of these winners. So the way I'm going to be reviewing these books is strictly on if I think they should be in young adult or not. Is this YA enough for a YA winner because some YA just doesn't feel like it's geared towards teens and I read a shit ton of young adults so this is perfect for me. I do want to make a disclaimer because I don't rate books. I do not give them a star rating so I will be reviewing them rather than reading them. I just stopped reading books and so that is something I wanted to point out. Also this is strictly a reading experiment. These are all of my own thoughts. If you disagree in any way let me know in the comments. We could have a great conversation about the Goodreads Choice Awards and if you agree or disagree with the winners. Speaking of the winners, let's start with 2013. The winner was Eleanor and Park by Rainbow Rowell. At that time, I was a really big Rainbow Rowell fan. I loved her book Fangirl and I was reading her a lot. She got me into reading, but booktube also was pushing her. However, since then I have reflected and listened to Asian reviewers and readers who have said that this book has harmful representation and is racist. But I am going to read the runner-up, which is Dare to You by Katie McGarry. I have heard this author before. I have no idea what it's about, but this just in. I'm learning that you can be nominated twice. I don't know if they stopped that, but I feel like you shouldn't be able to be nominated twice. That's just cheating. Uh oh. <laughs> In 2014, the winner was We Were Liars by E. Lockhart. I started booktube at this time and I read this book at this time. It was a book explosion, book of the month. I remember going to Barnes & Noble after I discovered booktube and became a booktuber and I just got all the popular books. So that is why I've read the majority of these winners. But for the books that I have already read, I will be basing my vote off of what I would have voted for at that time. Fun fact, in 2014, I actually voted forward to All the Boys I Love Before and I still stand by it. It should have won. Next, in 2015, the winner was All the Bright Places by Jennifer Niven. I remember this being a booktube staple and I looked up my review because I did read it and I gave it four stars, but like I didn't really like it that much. So I'm not really sure why I gave it a four star. Unfortunately, I couldn't find many of my reviews and I just remember not really enjoying it that much. I feel like it glamorized a lot of suicide and depression and it was a heavy read. I know some people enjoy it for the mental health representation, but at that time I just felt weird about it. I didn't like it that much, but I guess I liked it enough to give it a four star. <laughs> I did some searching and I found an Amazon review. So here you go. Here's my four star review. I guess I did like it, but I do know that there was a lot of talk about this book romanticizing depression and suicide, but I can't really comment on it because I haven't read it today. But like I said, I'm just going off of how I felt at that time. For 2016, we have Salt of the Sea by Rudis Apetes. I remember this being so popular, but this is where I get to the YA category being like, this is historical fiction. So the young adult category is anything that is not SFF. And so we're getting a lot of different genres in this. This is really thick. 
I didn't expect that. <laughs> so hopefully I can get the audiobook for this one. I'm no stranger to this book. I have seen it around booktube since 2016. So it makes sense that it is on this list. I actually have never even known what this is even about. I just know it's historical fiction. So here we are. <laughs> The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas won in 2017 and I have read this book and loved it. 2018 Leah on the Offbeat by Becky Abertali won. Becky Abertali I really enjoy but this wasn't my favorite one of the series. I did like the cameos of the characters. That's one of my favorite parts of her work but I just wasn't on board with the romance. In 2019 was Five Feet Apart by Rachel Limcott and I actually DNF'd this. So we're trying again. <laughs> I remember thinking that this book was pretentious and I don't know why. So I'm excited to just to get back into it and see what I think about it. I actually found a couple of my tweets about this book, but that's all I could find. In 2020, the winner was Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo, which is one of my favorite books by her. Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully was the winner in 2021, which I'm currently reading. And we will have to wait to see what the 2022 winner is. I have a few ideas. So here are my predictions really quick. I think The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School. I really want that one to win. Loveless by Alice Oseman will probably win. And that's like my top two that I really want to win. But honestly, we'll see what happens. So imagining that Firekeeper's Daughter is in this stack, maybe I'll put it in in editing. Here is my final TBR before we find out what the 2022 winner is. So throughout this video, I will be vlogging as I read. Wish me luck. Before I start reading, let me give you my predictions from best to worst. I think my number one is going to be Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully. I've been wanting to read this for a while and so far I'm really enjoying it. Number two is Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo because I love this so much. I feel like it's one of her most underrated stories. The Hate You Give is number three because I really enjoy this book. Number four is We Were Liars because I did give this a five star in 2014. My prediction at number five I think is going to be the 2022 winner and this should be either a Loveless or The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School. Number six is Leah on the Offbeat because it was fine. I like it in the YA sense. I think it's a really good YA, but I personally wasn't invested in the romance. Number seven is Salt of the Sea, just because I don't know if I really am gonna care much about it. I don't really care for historical fiction. Like I like it, but I don't like it that much. Third from the bottom is Five Feet Apart, because I think I'll like it, but I don't know if I'm going to love it. <laughs> I did give All the Bright Places a four star in 2017, but I just remember not being a huge fan of it. So it is going to be towards the bottom. And my last and final book that I think I'm going to hate is Dare to You by Katie McGarry. I just feel like this might have some problems. I know you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but for this book, I am doing that. <laughs> I just have a feeling that it's not going to be something that I enjoy. And I haven't read any reviews, like I'm going into this just not knowing anything. So this is my ranking before I read and then at the end of the video I will update you with my final ranking of best to worst. Hello, it's December 4th and I am reading the 2021 Goodreads pick for the Goodreads Choice Awards. This is Firekeeper's Daughter. I am 40% in and this is a book that I wish I read sooner. I wish more people told me to read it because I love it. It's very heavy so I'm taking my time with it. I've been reading it for the last couple weeks for Skoden Readathon and for Native American Heritage Month in November and I am very glad that I am because it has a lot of good things. This is about Donis who witnesses her best friend die and she is given the opportunity to help these officers just get to the bottom of a meth epidemic in her town. She's Ojibwe and this just talks about the history 
of living in 2004. She has a Blackberry and what I love most is I'm the hockey guy and everyone told me to read this because it has hockey in it and it has so many minute details about hockey. She has done her hockey history. The kids were just talking about whether or not they think the lockdown is going to happen. This book has so many good hockey knowledge and I'm excited to see how it wraps up. I am also listening to the audiobook I have through Libro FM and I'm just taking my time with this book because it's very heavy literally and physically <laughs> inside it's very heavy but also the book itself is really long but I'm really glad that this was a winner because it is a winner in my book. It's December 29th and last night I finished the audiobook of Firekeeper's Daughter and it was phenomenal. This is a master class in young adult fiction and if I were to pick my winner right now it would be this. This was such a phenomenal read. I cannot stop thinking about it and it is everything I ever wanted. So let's dive in. Set in 2004 in southwest Michigan, we're following 18-year-old Donis who is an Ojibwe girl who witnesses the death of her best friend. This is such a jarring book about grief and loss but it also talks about underprivileged communities, especially the indigenous communities, just how they're treated by society and due to poverty and living in an underprivileged area, the teenagers are ultimately set up to fail. At the start of the story, Donis is already grieving the death of her uncle David and her father but when her best friend is murdered by her boyfriend everything changes in her life. Big secrets are revealed and Donis is asked to be a part of an investigation. This investigation involves trying to uncover and solve the case of a meth epidemic and just a drug epidemic in the area and this really just goes into so many things. I am going to leave some indigenous reviews down below because as I am not, I think they obviously are going to do a way better job than I can. This is pitched as a YA mystery thriller and as it is because we are trying to solve a mystery and find out who is starting the whole drug escapade and why all of the teenagers are dying from drugs, we also have a really great coming of age story for Donis. She is grappling with a lot of grief at such a young age and at a rapid pace and she feels like she has to protect her family and friends but that is one of the biggest character developments of this book is that she learns that she can't do anything to stop what her family and friends are going to do but she can only be a part of it. But then she's finding out a lot about her history and about her family and this was just such an incredible book and it deserves all of the love. Hockey is a really big part of this book since we are set in Michigan but there are so many things that this book tackles especially talking about being in an underprivileged community because they are being donated pucks and sticks and it really just shows how hockey is a luxury sport. It's a very expensive sport and some kids are not able to. The NHL is very charitable and there's a lot of charities that help kids who are underprivileged be able to play hockey but I really like that we didn't just have a bunch of hockey. Like I love the hockey but I like also having the bigger conversations about how some kids play it for a certain reason or some kids just can't. And we get to see some hopeful teenagers who want to make it to the NHL but we also get to talk about injuries and how a severity of an injury can really impact a teenager and a lot of the time that is why they can't go on. I loved having hockey history here because we are living in 2004. The boys are mentioning the NHL lockout that soon happens in 2005 to 2006 where the whole season is shut down because of money. This also happened in 2012 to 2013 but it wasn't as long as that one. Oh, as a hockey fan it's horrible. It's a horrible time but I loved having that. Hockey is such a big part of my life so whenever we're 
getting some little historical facts. I am so excited. So I really enjoyed that. There's also a bigger conversation about the severity of injuries and playing through them. And there's always talk in books I've read about hockey about a kid who wants to play and hockey is really their only way out. And that is so true for so many kids. But I really liked that we didn't just have hockey there. I loved having the hockey games and just hockey references, but I liked that hockey was also a part of the story and we had some conversations. That's what I'm always looking for when I'm reading a book about hockey. You can really see how much Donis loves it. She plays left defense and she also watches her siblings play. Like I mentioned, the history is spot on. I knew that we were in a different era because Donis was on a Blackberry <laughs> and I was like, wait, she's using a blackberry where, where are we we're we're transported to a new time where am i at um but that was a really fun period i feel like i don't read many books that are set in the early 2000s for a historical fiction i love that it felt like we were in 2004 from the references to what they're doing because you can say that we're set in a time period but we need to see it and we definitely saw it here one thing i loved about the writing is that this story does not slow slow down. It is really good at pacing and we are met with some heavy topics but then the story does slow down a little bit but then you're hit with another thing and I really just loved this storytelling. We are given this really big story and that's why I think this book is perfect for 17 and 18 year olds. It is such a great book that talks about teenagers and is for teenagers. It shows them as the main character. Not once is Donis criticized by the adults in her life and I feel like that happens a lot in YA where the kids are not given a leeway and they're not trusted but in this regard Donis is supposed to be on this investigation with two other officers to try and solve this mystery and the case to help the community have some closure and just to stop this from ever happening again. I really enjoyed that Donis's character was true throughout the whole book. She never once changed in a big way besides the character development parts. She stayed true to herself and I loved her as a character. She doesn't take shit from anybody and she is just so level-headed but you're really seeing why she is. Donis is an angsty 18 year old girl who just wants the best for her family and wants to protect them from everything and will fight till the ends of the earth to get what she achieves and I mean that literally because just the third act of this book was so wild to me but in a fun way like the action is so good. This was just such an impeccable story. It deserves everything and this is such a phenomenal YA. Like this is probably one of the best YAs I have read in a long time and I read YA so much like I read it a lot. It has layers and overall it is a stunning yet horrific look at the darkness in native communities but it does show the brightness. There are good moments but I think that this is such a real look at what happens and what was happening in 2004 all from a teenager's perspective. The audiobook truly brought Donis and the story alive and if you can get the audiobook I highly recommend it. Thank you to Lero FM for providing me a copy and those were all of my thoughts on Firekeeper's Daughter. I'm so glad I read it and now on to the next. It's December 8th and the winners for the 2022 Goodreads Choice Awards were just announced so let's go over to my computer and react to what book I'm going to read. That shouldn't be allowed. So the winner is The Final Gambit by Jennifer Lynn Barnes and I really hope this means I don't have to read the whole series. I mean I'm fine with that but like I didn't want to have to do that and this is the third book in a series so I'm going to have to consult our group chat and figure out what to do because our runner-up is Loveless. Honestly, I really thought the Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School was going to win and I'm kind of upset. I mean, I guess I should have known but <sighs> it's fine. Maybe I can just get the audiobooks. I mean, I heard The Inheritance Games is a good series but I was not planning on reading a series 
in this video. So, plot twist. Okay, so after some consulting, I think I am going to read The Inheritance Games. And I also want to read Loveless just to see if I agree. I just think the Goodreads Awards need to have a better category. Because we need to have a category that has series when, like, this is YA fiction, so obviously all different genres are going to be just coupled in with it. But, like, I just think they could do it better. They really could do it better because I'm thinking YA contemporary when that's not really the case. I just think Goodreads should have more YA categories. I always say I love the Book Shimmy Awards hosted by Epic Reads because it is all YA and it just has so many different categories and just why does Goodreads still not have more YA categories because obviously this is YA fiction so anything that is an SFF is going to be in this category but I could not have predicted this at all. I mean maybe I should have because usually sequels and series win but like we'll see. Maybe I'll be surprised. I mean I've heard that the series is good. I'm now just gonna check my library to see if they have any of the audiobooks. <laughs> It's January 1st and today I am starting the Inheritance Games. I'm about to go on my walk so I'm going to start the audiobook of the first one that I just got on hold from my library and I will let you know how it goes. It's 10 hours so wish me luck. <laughs> Hello it's January 12th and I am still reading the Inheritance Games and I just want to talk. I'm 40% in and I was going to update at the 50 page mark but I really need to get this off my chest. Now I just looked and this book came out in 2020 so I just want to know why we're still creating YA books that have an incest theme. It's 2023. Get it together people. I would rather have no romance then have a romance of a girl who could potentially be interested in her family member. Now this is about Avery who is just an ordinary girl but one day she is pulled out of class and brought to Texas to find out that this man Tobias Hawthorne has put her in his will and is giving her the inheritance but the catch is she has never heard of this man in her life. So the whole story is her trying to find out through a series of clues and games to find out why she was put in the will and there are a lot of hard topics in this book. The sister is in a domestic abusive relationship so trigger warning for that. Also there are depictions of child abuse so as we don't know how Avery is related to the Hawthorns my first guess has to be it is a blood relative situation or she's like their third cousin or something. But it's really uncomfortable because I am reading the audiobook. I just can't help but feel uncomfortable when she's around Grayson who is one of the oldest Hawthorne brothers. It's either him or Nash. I honestly, there's so many brothers I have no idea who it is but it's one of them. She's feeling romantic feelings for him and then she's saying oh I shouldn't feel like this. Then why does the author need to write that in? I would rather read a YA mystery with no romance than hear about a potential incest situation where this girl is fancying her cousin. We don't need that. I really don't need that. I don't think we really needed a romance here at all. I think we could have a strong YA book about a girl who is learning about her family, maybe some secrets that she didn't know about because her mother did die from cancer. And I think the mystery and game part is cool but it's also super long. Like this book has 91 chapters and I just think in a YA, why? <laughs> like I don't think we really need that. I also want to point out that my comparison to this book is the Study in Charlotte series. I read that when it first came out. I think I only read the first book. I started the second and I never got around to finishing it but I am getting a lot of Study in Charlotte vibes. I think it's just because that's the only YA mystery I can really think of but the games are pretty fun. I just wish that this was a little more fast-paced. The chapters are short but 
I am 40% in and we're just getting around to some games. We had to really set up what this Hawthorne family is like and she's now living in their mansion and I feel like the book is still getting set up. I really don't see the point for a romance here. But those are my initial thoughts. I will update you when I finish the book or when something wild happens. I mean, this is the only wild thing. I have read some reviews that said that they felt uncomfortable about it, but it doesn't go anywhere. So I'm really hoping that that's true. But I also still stand by why the fuck do we need that? I'm officially 60% into the book and I am scared. And this is such a YA because she just kissed one of the brothers. It's just such a YA with like an unnecessary romance. So we're in more of like an action scene now. There was a shooting. And so I feel like this just always happens in YAs. Like something disastrous happens and then the kiss happens with the love interest. But like this isn't even the love interest that she had initially. Like I didn't even think she was attracted to this brother. But apparently she is and they just kissed and I feel uncomfortable. Based on what other people have told me who have read this and from reviews, I have gathered that this is more of an incest scare rather than it actually being incest. So I'm really glad, but I just still think it's unnecessary to have this romance. Book one down, on to the next. I was actually pleasantly surprised by this book. This is definitely a book that had me having to wait until the end to form an opinion because I just thought the middle was super slow and the build up to the actual mystery was slow, but the outcome was pretty thrilling and the third act was really good. I'm really excited now because I am going to be reading the whole series for this video because I need to find out why the final gambit won. I'm really glad that the first book didn't just wrap up very nicely and it ended the way it did because now I get to dive into book two and just continue. I'm so excited, which is really rare for me. I think this is a fun series. I can see why a YA audience would like it. I looked it up and it sold 1.5 million copies. So this is a pretty popular series, but I am going to get into book two and I'm going to just give you little updates because the final gambit is what we're here for, but so far so good. And they took a DNA test and Avery is not related to the Hawthorne brothers at all which is still a really weird situation that you needed to write in. Well, you didn't need to write it in, but... And I just don't think that's weird that she even put that plot point in there, why she even alluded to them being related. We didn't need that. The romance, I am just still not buying. So I really hope that it doesn't continue here, but it probably does. It's January 20th. I did get a haircut and I want to talk to you more about the Hawthorne legacy because I'm having fun, but man, the romance is still here. <laughs> At the end of the first book, we find out that Avery is not related to the Hawthorns by blood and the DNA test was negative. However, in this book, we find out that Tobias Hawthorne II, who they are looking for, may be her father. So she could still be their cousin. Like I'm not ruling that out. And it's weird and I just still think there should be no romance. I don't see a reason for it and I just hate that YA just feels the need to add one. We don't need this. I really don't need this love triangle. It's really disgusting and uncomfortable because the author is kind of implying and leading you to believe that they could be related and I just don't think that that's a good thing to do when you're writing a book for teenagers. Now, don't get me wrong, the mystery is really fun to read. I love the twists and turns, but I just think adding a romance was the wrong move here, especially just adding this creepy romance that is just making me uncomfortable. Like every time she flirts or has like a thought about one of the brothers, I want to be sick because I don't know what her relation is to him. So I'm not really sure what the author thought here. Like, I don't know if it's her intent to swage you 
to believe that they could be related and have it be this cool mystery story. I just think it's the wrong move if that's where she's going. I thought in the first book once the DNA results were revealed that I wouldn't continue with this and we would just be past it. But it's still happening where it's like, hey, he could actually be your dad. So you guys could still be related even if it's not by blood. You could still be a step sibling, a second cousin, a third cousin. You could still be related. And it's taking me out of the story because it's like, I care if this is a really weird and sexual relationship. And I just think she could have written it differently. Like, there's so many different opportunities to add a romance and I think it is poor on the author to just swage you in the way to think that they could be related and make it a forbidden romance. I hate that so much. I don't even know what to say here because I just have a feeling it's gonna be never ending because we're pulled in so many different directions that it's like, hey, he's your dad. And then you're also finding out that all of the other brothers have different dads and I'm just like I don't know what to do here but I know my gut instinct is telling me it's fucking weird. <laughs> I just finished up the second book and I will be moving on to the final book which was the winner for the Goodreads Choice Awards. This was my favorite one so far. It was really fun to read and I liked the mystery. I still am really confused about where we are in terms of romance. I still stand by we needed no romance here. I don't like how the end was in terms of the romance and I'm still confused why we have a romance. I mean, I don't want to say I'm confused because I understand why we have one because it's YA, but I just still stand by the statement that not all YA needs a romance and I think that this is a testament to that because I just don't need to read about a girl who could possibly be kissing her cousin. I was so uncomfortable and I think that the way she could have gone about it was wrong. I think we need to immediately debunk that she is somehow related because you can still be a step sibling, a cousin, or even a half sibling. There could be so many possibilities for her to still be related to the Hawthorns in some way, but the author still, time and time again, is still trying to make you root for this romance and it's weird because at times I was like oh they're pulling me in and then my adult brain is like no we don't want that please stop I hate this so much uh, I don't want her kissing in a hot tub I don't want her doing anything I just want her to live her life without any romance whatsoever so yeah I don't need the romance and I really don't care for reading the last book but that's what I need to do. So I am going to start this because I just finished this. So it's fresh in my mind, but I'll let you know how this goes. But I just read the synopsis and it just says a visitor comes. And I don't know, I just feel like this could have been a duology. After this book, I am totally done with this series and I'm done with the characters. I feel like I've gotten a lot of closure and the mystery that we were all trying to solve has been solved and I just don't see a need for the last book but it says a visitor arrives so I guess that's pretty interesting but I will see if it holds up to being a winner for the Goodreads Choice Awards. It's January 31st. Today I finished The Final Gambit and I want to say if you're gonna read this I highly recommend the audiobooks. I think they're really well done and ultimately this was a fun series to read. Besides the romance, I just hated the romance. But having finished the last book I don't see a need for this to be a trilogy. It could have been a duology. It was fine but I don't think 
it should have been the winner. I honestly think the strongest book was The Hawthorne Legacy. I'm not quite sure how to talk about this one because it's just following the events of the second book and we're just getting closer on a lot of things which was nice. And I liked seeing how it all wrapped up. So now that I finished off the last book, I did enjoy the way it takes you on a roller coaster. And I think the mysteries are really fun. I think that any teen would really love this. I think it's a really fun read and it's easy to read. I think that is why this is so popular because it's such an easy read. I was able to read the last book in about a week, but with the audiobook, I was reading it on 1.5 and two times speed and I finished it pretty quickly in the last couple of days. So it's an easy read and I think that's why it won in this category. Get to know your short term friends it's January 29th. Last night I finished Salt of the Sea and I really enjoyed it. I can see why it won in 2016 because it's a really great historical fiction and it's about a ship that went down similar to the Titanic but actually worse and it is just not talked about. I read the author's note and I'm glad that there was one because I love author's notes but also this helped me understand the story better just in terms of why she wrote it because she said she wanted to focus on the teenagers and the children that were affected at this time and wanted to bring light to this tragedy because nobody has ever talked about it or it's not well known. This is about the January 30th 1945 sinking of a German cruise liner in the Baltic Sea by a Soviet submarine. The cruise liner was supposed to bring refugees to safety, but it actually sunk. There were 10,500 passengers on the ship and because it was so overcrowded, it ended up sinking. This caused 9,000 passengers and 5,000 children to lose their lives. And this is all about that. And I thought it was really well done. I liked it a lot. I'm glad I finally read it because I feel like Salt of the Sea is a booktube favorite and I can see why. It's really good. This is a book I would recommend if you're a high school teacher, especially 12th grade. I think this would be perfect for a 12th grade English or history class. I think it's really fantastic. I'm actually glad that this video prompted me to read this because I really like the writing and I was recently sent Ruta Sepetti's writing craft book from Penguin Teen. It releases in May of 2023. I'm really excited to read this now and I hope that she has some tips on how to write multiple POV because there were so many characters in this book. There were some that I cared about, some that I didn't care about that much because some of them were fucking assholes, but I think due to it being set in 1945, a lot of it made sense. Overall, I really enjoyed this, but I do want to mention the ableism that I noticed. There is a blind character who is only referred to as the blind girl. I do believe we get her name at one point but I couldn't tell you what it is. And there are some thoughts that Amelia has where she is thinking about this girl and she's just wondering how she goes through life. And I understand it being a curiosity thing of maybe this is the first time she's ever met a blind person but I think this could have been a learning moment rather than just her being ableist. <laughs> and then later in the story, the blind character is killed off. So I thought I would point that out because it just made me feel weird. And I really wish that it would have been done better because I think we could have had a learning moment for Amelia where she learns that this person is a real human being and not just equated to their disability. Anyway, those are all my thoughts on Salt of the Sea. I really enjoyed it. And now I have two books remaining. The light is at the end of the tunnel. I can see it. <laughs> Get to know your short -term friends only I'm gonna start the audiobook for Five Feet Apart. I know I shouldn't wait till the end to pick up the 500 page romance, but you are allowed to DNF and I have a feeling this is gonna be the one that I choose to DNF because I don't see a need for this at all. 
I want to go back to 2019 me because I ended up finding my reading activity on Goodreads when I DNF'd this book prior. So I DNF'd this in 2019 because I didn't like Stella, our main character. So if you don't know, this book is about two teenagers who meet in a hospital and they both have cystic fibrosis. Stella is our female protagonist and Will is our male protagonist. And Will also developed B. Sapicha, which is a deadly disease and so the course of this book is their hate to love romance though I will get into that a little bit later. It's basically a forbidden romance because the thing about having cystic fibrosis is you are not allowed to be around other people who have it or you could die. So the whole idea in this book is that they have to be six feet apart but Stella decides that she is going to take back her life and she's actually going to be five feet apart. A big pattern I'm seeing in all of the books I've read so far for this video is these are easy reads. This took me about three days to read and I finished it up pretty quickly. As a fan of The Fault in Our Stars back in the day, I can totally see why this sold and is really popular. But from a book standpoint, I honestly don't think it was that good. I think it could have been way better and I wish it had more depth. And the background story of this book is it was once a screenplay and then it was novelized. So this is the novelization of the screenplay. So the screenplay came first, the book came second, and the movie came afterward. The book was inspired by Claire Wyland who is a YouTuber and she used to document her experience going through cystic fibrosis and she did pass away. As I read Stella, I could see a lot of Claire's story in her. So they definitely did pull from experience, which is nice because as I was reading this, I was really curious to see how accurate it was. So I am going to link some reviews down below that I watched here on YouTube and they're really great reviews from CFers. The majority of the reviews are positive, but they do go into some of the inaccuracies. And they did mention that this book and movie caused a big divide in the CF community, which was really interesting. So if you want to know more, definitely Definitely go and watch their reviews because they were really awesome and helped me understand better about the book because I thought it was fine. Like I didn't love it. I really wish it would have been more fleshed out because it just felt rushed. There is a hate to love at one point but what I hated is the anxiety that I had because they're not allowed to touch each other and I just felt really uncomfortable about that. But as I watched these reviews, they said that this does happen. I don't know how these clips are going to go. I'm trying to find the best lighting and it's just not working out. So let's finish up this review. Me personally, I don't like the stories where girl meets boy and girl saves boy or vice versa. And that's what we had in the beginning of this book and that is why I DNF'd it in the first place. And I'm kind of glad I did because like, I don't see a need to finish this. I like the representation. I think it's important to spread awareness about cystic fibrosis and it's important for sick kids to see themselves in books and have their own love stories. So for that, I applaud this book. I think it was great in that regard, but it could have been so much better. I like forbidden romances, but this gave me so much anxiety because if they touch each other, they die and I just hated having that anxiety. It could have been so much better fleshed out because it felt super rushed and I wish that I had seen more from all of the characters. Now this is a dual perspective between Stella and Will so I did like that. Will was really funny and I did laugh at a lot of the things that he said so I did have a fun time reading the book despite the anxiety but I do want to bring up something that rubbed me the wrong way was that Poe, who is Colombian and gay, he's our only diverse character in this book. Besides Barb, she's a nurse and I believe that she is a black woman. I know she is in the movie and I didn't like that he got killed off. I'm like, why did the only diverse character get killed off? That's kind of weird because everybody else lived besides Abby because Abby ended up dying cliff jumping. But Dude, why did Poe get killed off? Like, that just is weird to me. It's weird. I, I don't get it. Because we don't really get to know him that much, like kind of. 
I wish he would have had more page time because he is Stella's best friend, but I feel like I only saw bits and pieces of him. I just wish that it would have been longer, which is something that I don't say very often, but I think that it could have been so much better developed, but I am gonna watch the movie because I'm curious and I wanna see some of the scenes, but the end also scared the shit out of me and I was really just confused to why that happened. Like, it's great they had a happily ever after, but I feel like it wouldn't have been accurate. Now, I'm not a doctor. I don't know anything about CF, so it's really not my place to say that, but it just felt unrealistic at the end, and I hate the ending of books where the characters change completely and you just feel like it's a different person. So, I just wish it would have had more development, but I'm excited to read more of Rachel Limcott because she has a book that came out. It's a sapphic romance called She's the Girl, so I'm excited to read that one. I didn't hate this, but like I said, it could have been done better. I don't want to compare this to The Fault in Our Stars because they are completely different stories, but this being a sick kid romance makes a lot of sense to why it was really popular, but I like that it was a winner because it does help spread awareness for CF. So pretty good in that regard, but the book was just fine. And now on to the final book. I'm so happy, <laughs> but I'm so scared at the same time. Get to know your short -term friends, your only I guess you could say I judged a book by its cover because I didn't think I was going to like this at all. And it actually wasn't half bad. Beth has gone through a lot of trauma in this book and we get to see how she reacts to other people based on her lived experiences. And basically she thinks that she's not worthy of love and has to protect her mom at all costs. This is a dark contemporary that talks about drug use, addiction, and abuse. There is graphic abuse on the page. And basically we're following Beth who has lived with her mom. It was really heartbreaking at times to read from Beth because her mom is living with addiction and it was really sad because Beth has always been told that she is responsible for her mom and she is just a teenager and it is really sad. But I think it was really well written because you really feel for Beth and you believe a lot of the things she's saying. I'm glad that's my final takeaway because at the beginning I thought that these were just cookie cutter characters with stereotypes slapped onto them, but they became a whole character at the end of the book. As we have a lot of character development, it was super strong and I'm really glad about that because I was so nervous because there's a lot of shit that goes on in this book. <laughs> anyway, I really liked the complexity of Beth and how we got to see multiple facets of her. Beth is a multifaceted strong character and I really like seeing her develop because the adults around her besides her uncle are telling her that she is responsible for her mom and she starts feeling guilty. There's a scene where she calls her mom and the phone is disconnected and Beth starts beating herself up because she didn't pay for the phone bill. But she's a teenager and that is not her responsibility. However, her aunt is telling her that it is her responsibility and that was just so heartbreaking. There is a lot of drug use and addiction talk in this book. So if you were going to read it at any point, just want to let you know that. Now let's talk about Ryan because I liked his character development as well. I was really nervous because at the beginning of the book we find out that he's a homophobe but his development is great because I think what it was is he is in a home of parents who are telling him that his brother is bad for being gay. It's bad that his brother doesn't talk to them. And I think when you're growing up in an environment like that, your worldview is going to be blindsided and you're not going to be able to form your own opinion. And two, when you're a kid and you're hearing what the adults around you are saying, you take it as word. And you're like, okay, that's true. Um, until Beth has to actually tell him off. And then he finally is like, oh, I didn't know that I was homophobic this whole time. <laughs> like, I can't believe it took you that long to find out that you're homophobic. But then you get to see how his relationship with his brother changes. Because 
really, he learns that he's afraid of his parents and he doesn't want to make his own decision. That was his main flaw and I really like how it was broken down and changed. I think the change in this book was so good. So this was actually pretty solid and I really liked the baseball. I'm not one for baseball. I don't care for it that much unless it's playoffs, but I really like the way it was written. It was cool because you're really in Ryan's head as he is pitching and I thought it was a nice perspective. It's different from what I usually read. So as a story, I thought it was pretty strong. There are some instances of problematic elements, including the homophobia, even though it was challenged and resolved. We also have a lot of outdated language and some slurs. There's also a lot of slut shaming. Both genders are constantly calling each other sluts and whores and it does get resolved a little bit, but there's a lot. There's not a lot of joy happening here. We don't really see Beth get a lot of joy unless it's the romance and I wish that she had maybe found a friend or something. There is some like rekindling of friendships, but in the end, I thought it was pretty solid. Besides all the problematic shit, I am pleasantly surprised by this book. I might actually pick this author up, but I don't really see that happening in the near future. I have better books that I could read. But anyway, this one wasn't half bad. Now we've made it to the end of this video and I'm going to share my finalized best to worst list. A lot of the books surprised me. So this list is very different than the beginning. So for a refresher, here was my list at the start of this video before I read any of these books. And now here is my final list. My top three stayed the same. Firekeeper's Daughter is my number one. It is the best book out of everything I read, followed by Clap When You Land and The Hate You Give. And then I changed the spot for We Were Liars, so that's bumped down and replaced with Salt to the Sea. Then I have Leah on the Offbeat by Becky Albertalli. I think this is still a solid YA with queer characters, and I'm glad that it was included, though just for me personally, it's not my favorite of the series. And my bottom five is All the Bright Places, Five Feet Apart, Dare You Too, and my final book is The Final Gambit. I didn't do that intentionally, but I just did not care for that book whatsoever. I really struggled with this list. I put it off for several days because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I didn't hate any of the books. They're all good in their own way. Obviously, most of them have flaws, but also based on my own enjoyment, which is why The Final Gambit is the final book, because I didn't enjoy it as much and I just don't think it should have won. And that is it for this video. Thank you so much if you stayed until the end. And if you did, drop a trophy emoji in the comments so I know you stayed. And leave a comment talking about the video. Let me know all of your thoughts on my thoughts on the books. Let's talk in the comments. It really helps out my channel when you like and comment, so thanks if you do. Definitely go and check out everybody else who was included in this collab, and thank you to Izzy and Bethany for asking me to be a part of this. It was really fun, and kudos to everybody who makes videos like this because I went through the ringer doing this video. <laughs> Anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you want to support this channel, the best way to do so is hit subscribe. And I also have a Patreon where I host a bi-monthly LGBTQ plus book club. And there's a private Discord where I host watch parties. So if you want to support me further, Patreon is the best way. Thank you for watching and I will see you in my next video very soon. Bye.